Hello and welcome to the Flix Forum podcast, where each episode we go back and we look at a Netflix original film in the order of release. This episode, we have Netflix 173rd film from 2019. It's the sci-fi thriller In the Shadow of the Moon, directed by Jim Mickle. It stars Boyd Holbrook, Cleopatra Coleman, and Michael C. Hall. I'm Jesse, and I'm with MJ. Hello. How are you, mate? Good, 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 good. It's um, nice to, to see you, even though it's through the screen. I have seen you recently <laughs> face-to-face a bit more, which has been nice. We do need to organise a, uh, a podcast in person, which I think... we. It was our hundredth movie, wasn't it? The last time we've done one in person. Yeah. <laughs> the first, the first like sixty were all in person. We didn't even mm. consider the idea of doing it remotely. Mm. Uh, so we've done, it's done like another, there's been like another seventy. It's just hundred seventy three, seventy three mm. movies, give or take, because we've done a few bonuses without actually doing it in person. We we should uh, take that up. That would be nice. It'd be um, good to yeah sit in the same room and do it. Um, We'll, we'll get into this film. We, we start our show with the Fast Flicks where we give a quick little summary about what the, the film sort of touches on. So what's In the Shadow of the Moon about for you? Yeah, I've thought about this one. I would always try and do my Fast Flicks as my, uh, my little elevator pitch to anyone because I've since I've watched this movie, I've talked to people about like, oh, I watched this movie. What's it about? So I'm like, well, this is a good, good tip for my Fast Flicks. But in the Shadow of the Moon is about a detective who tries to catch a serial killer who is defying all kinds of rational logic to return every nine years and murder new victims. I like that. Uh, that's very nice. It's got lots in it. I've, I've got a similar thing, but don't have as much uh, coverage as you because I've just said it's a detective who becomes obsessed with killings that occur every nine years and can't quite let the case go. No, that's great as well. They actually, they are very similar. And yeah. actually, let's right now do a spoiler alert because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm worried I'm just going to dip into it accidentally. So if you haven't watched this film, we're going to spoil the hell out of this film. And this is a film that can be spoiled and ruined if it is spoiled. So um, stop listening to us if you haven't watched it and you want to yeah. watch it. Uh, then come back to us because, the, as I said, there's other elements. So that's a spoiler alert done. So stop listening. <laughs> um, there's other elements that you could include into that fast flick that make mm. the movie you know, more interesting as well. But that fast flicks alone, or well, that little elevator pitch alone is still pretty intriguing. If someone said that to me, I'm like, I, I, I'm interested to watch that movie. Yeah, because there's so much more, like you said, that you can put into it that is going to give away a lot more than, than you need yeah. to. Um, yeah, it's true. Well, fill us in on what we could work out about how this one came to Netflix, I guess, and what's some background. Well, this one was really quite a dull story. I wasn't expecting this. When I was watching this, <laughs> I, I noted that it had, quite high production values and you know there, it was not a straightforward film to be made and that's not to suggest that Netflix can't make those sorts of films but often you see a movie like this you know it was a universal film that they ended up losing faith in and they bummed it out and decided they weren't going to finish it and Netflix picked it up but no this was this was Netflix through and through um, it was announced in February 2018 Jim Mickle was on board to direct this movie and Boyd Holbrook was going to star uh, and it was going to be produced and distributed by Netflix. So good on them. Obviously, they've done 170 movies now, so they can get to a point where they can make these sort of movies. I couldn't find a budget anywhere, mind you. Um, principal production for it began in start of July 2018, lasted just under two months. They filmed it in Toronto, Canada, and then it had its premiere at Fantastic Fest on the 21st of September 2019. And then a week later, or six days later on the 27th, it was available to stream on Netflix. So this is a pretty run-of-the-mill standard story of Netflix deciding they finding a script they like, getting a director, getting an actor on board, making a film. And as they did have a nice little premiere, so it did premiere at a festival, but then it came on Netflix. This is run-of-the-mill story. Yeah, I, I guess this is sort of, uh, we haven't seen this in a while, but the director, Jim Mickle, he's in, a, in an interview, he, he commented and said, we're lucky to have such an incredibly talented production team and a home like Netflix that's excited to take chances. Any studio that makes Oksha has a permanent place in my heart. So a little bit of a love fest um, there for Netflix. Well done by Netflix. I, I, how many people associate Netflix with Okja? in the sense that, oh, Netflix can make quality films. So mm. they, they definitely nailed that one in terms of piquing the interest of people wanting to work with Netflix. Hmm. 
It had two nominations for awards. So it was nominated for the Outstanding Achievement in Casting for a Non-Theatrical Film at the Casting Society of America Awards and also nominated for Best Costume Design in a Contemporary Film at the CAFTCAD Awards, which I have no idea what they are. Um, <laughs> but Interesting awards. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. No. Yeah. Tagline. Did you see the tagline for this one? No, I didn't. You know, I try and avoid it. Okay, well, this one is Some Crimes Defy Time, which I, I don't yeah. mind. I don't mind. It's not bad. There's not a lot of meat on it. It, it, it no. works for me, but they, I feel like there's so much in this movie you could have come up with a better tagline. Anything. Yeah, true. That's a good point. Uh, translations across the world. So oh, yeah. Argentina and Mexico, very like similar. It was called Hidden by the Moon. So, yeah, sits in there well. Uh, in Portugal and Spain, and I reckon maybe they didn't go with this in uh, English language countries because there might have been a copyright infringement, but it was called The Dark Side of the Moon. I think okay. I probably want to keep away from that one. Um, the best one was from the United Arab Emirates where it was called On Such a Night. <laughs> Sounds like a romantic okay. film. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> has a different feel to it, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, God. I, I had a percentage match for this one. Did you? So did I. Oh, good. What did you get? Mine was 69% which is not very high. I, I normally get them a bit higher. Um, with that said, there is a lot of sci-fi elements to this, and I, I suppose I historically don't connect with sci-fi as much, so I wonder if that, that played a part. Um, I had it even lower. I had 59%. So, oh, um, again, that's almost saying don't bother. Yeah. Almost hey, Jesse, we made this movie. We, we spent all this money on making this movie for our platform, but people don't <laughs> yeah. watch it. Don't watch it, yeah. Well, lead us into your early thoughts. What, do you, what did you think for this one? I love oh, this so, movie. Hang on, sorry, sorry, sorry. We missed the consensus. <laughs> oh, we did. I've, I've jumped. Well, I've jumped. What did, what did other people say first? <laughs> I I'm a little bit disappointed in the consensus because I did love this movie. One thing I found very interesting though with the consensus, so it's a six point two out of ten on IMDb, which is a respectable score. Forty eight thousand ratings on IMDb, which surprised I'd never heard of this film prior to mm. doing the podcast. Um, but forty eight thousand is quite a high number of ratings, and then Letterboxd. 2.8 out of 5, so they didn't enjoy it as much, and only 18,000 ratings. Recently, we've been seeing Letterboxd eclipsing uh, IMDb on, on the amount of ratings, but it's just so low. I, it's just something about the, the audience with IMDb that really worked for this film. I don't know what it is. Well, the critics on Rotten Tomatoes didn't like it. It sits at Rotten on 57%. That's on 53 reviews. And the audience had it even lower on 39%. That's on a bit over 250. So, um, yeah, not not positive from that end. But obviously, this is where I was meant to segue in. And now, <laughs> what are your thoughts? I don't want to give much away. But yeah. uh, no, I love I loved this movie. Um, I have no idea where this movie came from. Um, but I loved it from basically the opening minute until the end. And I don't think I felt this way watching a movie since since I watched The Discovery um, on this podcast, which was, I don't know, like two years ago? We watched yeah. that one a while ago. Um, I just, for me, it was the, the ability to, to crave more. And, and I just wanted to learn and understand this situation. And I felt so satisfied with the resolution. Uh, I know personally when I do watch a movie, I love a movie that's got a slow reveal, particularly when they do continue to feed your intrigue time after time after time. I feel like every 10 minutes passed, I knew something a little bit more, but then I still wanted to know more. It was um, it was just such a satisfying experience. I, I, I can't wait to talk about it. Yeah, I have some very similar thoughts. I, I was in from the start. I, I really wanted to know where it was going. And I think even though I picked up on a couple of the storylines and a few of the, like, there's some pretty obvious leads that, that occur. I think it was still nice to see it all come together. Uh, so yeah, positive from me as well. And it did. It just came. It was all clean. There was no bits where you're like, "Oh, does that does that fit here?" Like, mm. it was, and, and you're right. There were bits that like became obvious, but it, I still just appreciated its cleanness to it. Mm. I was so surprised when I saw it was like two point eight on Letterbox. I'm like, "Where's this movie been hiding? And why does everyone hate it?" <laughs> well, fill us in on some characters. Um, who, who do you want to start off with when we talk about some characters? This is a hard one because there's there's a lot of, I guess you could say there's a lot of important characters in this film. But I do feel like everything revolves around our main character. And I don't think any of them are fleshed out well enough to understand how they exist without him and his perspective. So I'm obviously talking about Tommy or Tommy Lockhart, Locke, played by Boyd, Boyd Holbrook. And I think 
in, in a way, this is really his story. This this whole film is his story. And that's why I think I liked it so much is because it functions on a personal level. But there's this wider, big social theme going on within this story. But we're, we're kind of focusing on how one man's life has been impacted by these events. And what, what I liked about him as a character and, and the, the way that his, his arc kind of comes to conclusion is that it does come full circle. He's basically got this need to move on from an incident that happened to him at the start of this film. And on the one hand, you know, he actually couldn't have done anything to prevent his wife from dying. He couldn't have done anything to prevent all the other things that have happened to him. But on the other hand, how the hell can you expect this guy to move on when he knows what he knows? He's had these like brief interactions with something that is just mind blowing that you would lose sleep over every single night trying to find answers to it. And you can't get answers to it until nine years passes and you get a chance to maybe get another answer that would drive you crazy. And I think that's what drives this film is that yes, we're watching him slowly deteriorate, but you get it. Like there's no other way to go about it. It's almost like this, the characters later on in the film are just like, come on, you just got to move on from this. But how the hell can you move on? And I think that is captured so well with this guy because the movie, as I said, is about the big picture versus the small picture. You know, he, he can't move away from this big picture story impacting his life so directly and it's killing him. And it's, it's just it's, it's fascinating. I've never, I've never been so into someone's own story and understood where they're coming from from even though I kind of knew where it was going. I don't know. It just worked. I think I backing onto what you've said there with, with the time jumps, I think that the ability to show nine years every time and just have one focus of his decline sort of really helps with the character, I guess, like, because you see, um, you know, through the lack of time with his daughter or, um, you know, just these tiny little things about having ice cream for breakfast. Like, you know, you, they, all they say is one line and you know what that's been like for those last nine years mm. that obviously that relationship hasn't been great and the promises of going to the zoo and there's one scene where he puts a bit of booze in his coffee so you know he's he's even going further down that rabbit hole and, you know, yeah. still rocking up to school late to pick his daughter up, not having the daughter living with him. I think just like a, a small little thing each time jump, you know, does a really good job because like you mentioned as well, that idea of him struggling with life after losing his wife. And, and and that's a mechanism we often see in film and in real life is that people put themselves into their work. And it's a, a contrasting thing because as an audience member, we know that his daughter, Amy, is like the, the closest thing to his wife that's possible. But um, that distance that he's, he's creating between her through the dedication in trying to solve this because in the back of his mind, he's like, if I can do some sort of time loop, I can bring her back. So it's not, mm. it's, it's that idea of letting go a little bit too um, through his character. But yeah, I think the name too, through a lot of the imagery that we see throughout and the, um, the leaders throughout America, like Locke is um, a very perfect name to have for him's character as well. And that's definitely purposely done. I like what you said actually about the, um, you know, getting glimpses every nine years and, and, and when the circumstances change every nine years, because the first nine years, he's grieving from the, from the loss of his wife. And, and as you said, he's thrown himself into his work, not just this case, but everything. He's obviously got a promotion as a detective, which we kind of saw coming. And his interaction with Raya at that point was quite minimal, but still enough to really cause some intrigue. By the next time jump, he has gone through this whole wormhole with Raya. He's learned a lot more without having any answers. And it's no surprise to see him disheveled and basically living in his car obsessed with this case because he just knows so much that he shouldn't know and he can't piece it all together. It, it, it just it makes so much sense that he ends up there. Yeah, perfectly said. Who would you like to speak about next? I've got Holt. I felt I felt weird when he became like, was he like a captain? And it was like Captain Holt. And I got real Brooklyn Nine-Nine vibes <laughs> from, yeah. from this at some point. The, even Detective Holt felt a bit weird. Uh, but anyway, Michael C. Hall's character. I, I still I still feel like every character, arguably Ryer aside, just forms part of Tommy's story. But when this movie first started and, and it felt to me like it was going to be this serial killer investigation, some zodiac S type story, this arrogant brother in law component felt like a thing that was going to be a big part of the movie and i think when the time travel component and, and in turn the personal demise of tommy became the main focus holt more or less to me just functioned as this support character that was an example of um 
what life was doing without him, that everyone in the whole world was basically moving on, uh, someone to look after his daughter and to be there from a, from a family perspective, but also not completely disowning Tommy that he was entirely alone. That's kind of where Holt ended up for me um, and his arrogant, uh, ambitious side of him became less important. I completely agree with you. And I sort of took all of that as well and sort of looked at it in a little bit of a different way in that um, I guess we see at the start how, you know, the, the not hatred, but the um, competitiveness between the two and how it seems like Holt's always been the bigger and better sort of, um, you know, job or person at the, the police force. And I think that at the start of the film, the worst thing possible that could ever have happened to Locke would be for Amy, his daughter, to be with Holt. And we see that towards the end this happens. And at the start of the film, that would have been the worst thing possible for him. Mm. But he's so consumed with his case, it sort of adds a little bit further to um, that downfall of Locke as well in that he's not even reacting that much that his Mm. daughter's with the person that was like his, you know, public enemy number one at work and in the family, I guess. It's not a bad point. I kind of as a like leads on development of, of Holt in the sense where he says like you know you're a good man he goes no I'm not I'm a dick but at least I know it kind of thing it's like oh mm. you are self-aware enough to know that that's what you've no, been this time hmm. anyone else that you wanted to touch on I I want to talk about Raya um, it's really difficult to you know surmise too much about this character but what I did like and I, what I again think worked in this movie is I, I really liked the vulnerability in her she never felt like this invincible extraterrestrial type being that could, could have been what we thought was happening in a movie where someone's killing someone every, um, killing people on the day, every nine years, defying complete logic, where the hell does this come from? She had that vulnerability and, and it kind of added this much more human component that was the thread throughout the whole film rather than what could have been just a really big sci-fi film. And I think, um, there were sci-fi elements to this film, but it felt much more like a human emotion film than anything else. And I think that that's probably what caused a lot of it. I completely agree. I think that you add in the mysteriousness of with the humanity of that character, and then you're going to build a connection rather than a, a species that no one's heard of or known before. So if you've got a human that's mysterious, shows human qualities and doesn't necessarily, you know, <laughs> grow extra arms or anything like that, then Mm -hmm. you're going to be like, okay, I can sort of see myself as this character. I can see that this character can be relatable. So I think you you bang on them. I like, and I think that's why I like, like you could do that and this becomes a completely different film. Mm -hmm. It's still a fun sci-fi journey. Like the time can travel component is still really clever and fun. Um, But this movie takes them to another level and that's what connected me with it. I, there's the others. There's not really much. Like Maddox was Locke's, Locke's um, you know, partner in crime, and you know, obviously a good supporting role to him. But apart from that resemblance or that the teddy bear that um, sort of was in the car, that was a nice little touch. Not too much else mm. about him really. And the same with Naveen, the the scientist who sort of comes up with this theory, I guess. Yeah, I thought there'd be a lot more of Naveen. And look, sorry, he actually plays quite a big role in the overall story, but the character we don't really know and, and, and Maddox yeah like he's kind of like the experienced comfortable non-risk-taking cop in comparison to Tommy's gung-ho ambitious policing techniques and he seemed to be destined to be killed at some point by being dragged into Tommy's shenanigans um, but I also think his death um, started the, the real demise of Tommy as well um, and particularly as well with Raya being like oh that wasn't planned it was like the one thing that just didn't work to plan and that just derailed him completely but similarly, nothing happens if that doesn't happen because the whole butterfly effect syndrome kind of comes into play. The director, Jim Mickle, anything that you learned about him? Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with his work. I don't know the name. He's um, looks like he's done a little bit of work. He's done a few movies uh, in the past sort of decade and he's done a bit of TV. I don't really know, but he's been around and... Um, yeah, from yeah. what I from what I read, he sort of stumbled across his script and read it, and he's like, "Holy hell, that really took me!" And he read it again and saw it come to life. He's like, "I got to do this movie." Yeah, a lot of writing credits, and I think the biggest sort of one that possibly got from doing this is that Sweet Tooth series on Netflix, which 
was quite big in the last 12 months ah, or so. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yep. so direct, directed him? a few of those episodes too. Yeah, wrote it and directed some. So, yeah. Yeah, that's um, right. that was hitting hard last yeah, year. Yeah, it was. Uh, all right. What are some scenes in this one that you enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, like, there's probably a whole bunch of scenes back to back that I really enjoyed. But I think like that opening of the film with the diner chef and, and the pianist and the bus driver, just the, the pacing of that and then the, the violence, graphic nature, and, and I guess building that intrigue immediately was so well done. Like I was, I was just, my intrigue for this film started within the first three minutes and didn't end until the movie ended and it was just set up perfectly with that scene. I've literally got exactly the same thing. I'm just like the opening with the piano, the bus driver, the chef. I've used the same word, intrigued, um, why they were targeted, mm. etc. I'm in. So, yeah. Fascinated. <laughs> yep. I even, I think maybe I was just feeling, you know, a romantic connection with this film straight away. But that, that first chase scene as well, it, it lingered on a little bit, um, but it was absolutely electric. Like the idea of who's going to die. I'm like, someone's going to die in this scene. And, and, and how will Rai get away? You're not going to catch the serial killer in the first half hour of a movie. And then it was sort of taken to a whole new level when she kind of knows Tommy and she apologizes and recognizes his daughter. And you don't assume she's going to get hit by a train at that point. My brain was just spinning. And um, yeah, it was just, I guess that's the half hour into the film. We've had those two important scenes. And I've just never been so hooked on a film in such a long time. Off the back of that, though, I was actually breathless for his wife's death because at one point, um, Raya apologizes for your partner's death. And I, obviously, she meant Maddox because, you know, she killed him in the last time loop. And I thought that too. And I'm like, oh, maybe he's going to die from this broken leg. And then I'm like, oh, maybe she meant partner is in wife. And I was watching this scene like, don't die, don't die, don't die. And, you know, she died. And, but I just, I guess it was just a sign that I was just so into this movie at that point. And, um, then I think that I um, I was just sort of focusing on the film. I didn't, I haven't written down any of the scenes until that revelation scene on the beach. And you know, I always get to this point. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed when it comes to picking twists and stuff. So I get there like five seconds before the reveal. You know, you're like, oh, so this is why she said. So this is where it happens at the very beginning. And this is why it all started in 1988, why it ended, why, why it didn't go earlier than 88. And everything just added up so perfectly. I was just so, I just felt so satisfied with that reveal scene and, and everything just fit into place. It just, my brain was just very, very happy with how it all landed. So yeah, that's, that's the scenes for me. Good. Um, well, yeah, the opening we mentioned before, I, every sort of, um, scene where there was one of the the murders i i thoroughly enjoyed looking out for like there was a the thomas jefferson book at the bus side at the start that was really like in your face so then that was a bit obvious went, yeah. yeah that was very obvious but then you know the the teacher's desk there was like an andrew jackson book and it was just nice to because in the back of my mind i'm like what do all of these american leaders have to do because we've got Locke running mm -hmm. around what what are all these um leaders and political thinkers have to do and obviously um the one thing that in the opening scene where they're they're in that office and the city's sort of falling apart and the flag sort of goes past and i'm like that wasn't the american flag so in the back of my mind the whole time i'm sort of trying to work out what this is all to, to what, what's the connection i guess so um i enjoyed that side of the film as well i guess yeah um the when they sort of have the the first scene with raya um and they put out the police call for the black female and just, there was just a really good little montage of the cops arresting people taking the mug shots sketches the race the racial profiling that that's like prolific in the states and the protests it's all done nicely and it wasn't too um in your face in the narrative just to show that this film's 2019 but we still have an idea about what's going on um as well so i thought that was done nicely and mm -hmm. Last thing that I enjoyed was at the airfield, there's a scene where Locke's sort of talking to the the owner at the airfield there. And I just really liked the way they communicated. Like it's a really nice way to like through writing of notes, like scratching your head if she's in the other room. And I just thought it was really well done because as an audience member, like how, how are they going to get out of this situation? It was just cool to see that those visual um, ways of communicating working. So that was cool. And it works well um, as in a visual medium. Like it works well on film. It's a fun way to, to bring it together, even though it didn't work. What they were trying to do didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right. What, what are some things that you didn't like in this one? I, honestly, there was, there was so little that I didn't like about this mm. film. If anything, the final monologue scene, um, 
just felt a little bit jerky and forced and maybe a little bit too much in your face. We, I kind of got it, everything that she said. Like, I was like, I, I got it from watching the film. Um, but I, I, didn't, I didn't hate it by any means. I'm clutching at straws to have it there as a scene I didn't like. The only other thing I didn't like, and I'm not going to have any reservations for this because it was a terrible movie poster. Have you, you seen the poster of the film? It's yeah. terrible. When I went to log it on Letterboxd <laughs> after I watched it, I'm like, this isn't, this isn't the movie I just watched. And I look, I'm like, oh, God, it's just like a big thing of him with a moustache. <laughs> and obviously, I think the, the small part of it is actually quite nice. Uh, underneath that, there's like a you know, dark street with, with rye with a hood on. That's, that should have been the main poster of it. Not bloody Boyd Holbrook with a moustache looking like Brad Pitt from Inglorious Bastards. Just, I, I just... They got that so wrong, that movie poster. Yeah, they probably they probably through test screenings knew it wasn't going to hit the, the mark with a lot of people anyway. Um, for me, I think the, the, this is probably a case of Netflix giving them too much money for this movie because I think that the action pieces, these big action sets, they didn't really add anything to the narrative. And I think like we've touched on a little bit with the characters and things, like we've got this villain that we, we think is a villain that we sort of are interested in for the humanity side of things. I don't know that we needed like that reverse car chase down the alley and the big plane scene. Cause that just looked kind of fake anyway. And the, the big chase on the motorbike through the warehouse and down on the beach and Naveen's car crashing. It's just like, we've got this money. So let's make the most of it. Whereas if you like pulled them back a little bit, um, you don't need like some of those scenes went on and on and on. And I think that's probably the, the next part. The, the only other part I didn't like about it was with that plane crash lock under the water. How long did he stay under the water? It's like, we know mm. as an audience member that he's not going to drown. So for him to just get to the surface and be like, Oh, there's a land. I'll just swim there. Like it was just a really poor payoff. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, it was, I was either like, that was the quickest dream ever. And they've only just taken off and he fell asleep for like two seconds or like, it was just, I don't know. Yeah, like, I, 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 it's a good bring point. It, bring, it back, yeah. bring it back a bit. <laughs> he was in the water for too long. I agree. And you're right. He was never going to die. That was. No. This is the man that we're following for the yeah. next hour. Um, the the action piece is an interesting point because I think you're right. I think they didn't need it. And I think we, we just talked about the scenes that we liked and none of them came up. Not to say that we're action junkies, but I don't think they detracted from the film. But there was certainly like, yeah, if you're watching a guy reversing through alleyways, like that should be that should be one of the best scenes. Like you should be like, how cool was that scene? Do you remember that scene? Yeah. So you're right. They they probably missed a beat. Um, but it probably didn't take away from the film as much. But that underwater one was good. Yeah, that annoyed me too. <laughs> good. All right. Well, uh, what's the movie trying to say? What are some themes or some ideas in this one? The movie's saying a lot, which is commendable considering um that it's doing it all within this sci-fi time travel serial killer thing as well. Um what I, what I like about most, and I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that this is we're seeing the story from from Tommy, but there's a, there's a massive big picture story, and we as an audience, we figure out earlier than the characters do what she's doing that she's basically eliminating these people because they're about to cause something, you know, quite catastrophic in the future, and we've got this big picture story versus the small picture story, and we've tied that in with these sci-fi elements but also there's this political silencing component to it versus what ends up being a very personal journey of tommy and it all ties into this one film and i don't think any of those factors detract from each other in any way which is just commendable because i think the big picture story is really interesting it ties in with the political stuff and the 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 race stuff and what could potentially cause a civil war the sci-fi components certainly don't take away from what can be a serious a very serious story and journey but then we've got this one guy who's trying to deal with grief who's trying to deal with his whole life being thrown apart and that still doesn't take away from everything as well and i I think the fact that they can do them all together is a really really hard thing to do and and that's why i think the movie works so well yep i think that you you've touched on all of them nicely and tied them all in and i think that that idea you know like you mentioned the idea of the trauma and dealing with loss and coming to terms with that and we sort of t- I touched on this before as well, that idea, what's the, the line between your family commitments, your work commitments, and then that leads into that idea of the police inadequacies and the profiling. And then as you mentioned with the, the race stuff, like, like the idea of suppression of ideas and avoiding the, the dangers of white supremacy, I guess. The one little thing that I'm not 100% sure, and like this is just a, I think it was really, the story was really engaging, but 
I'm not sure killing people is the right way to promote democracy. <laughs> like, we've got an assassin who's killing people for their, their own ideas, whereas democracy is the idea of having ideas. And, you know, it was just a little bit iffy on that. That's a great point. I, I was completely blindsided by that. Because I guess if you if you look back and you go, imagine if we uh, imagine if we didn't have Adolf Hitler, for example. Imagine if we just eliminated him when he was a kid. You know, would we be in a better place? And it's obviously bigger than that because there's probably more more factors at play. But is that the right decision? And I guess the film doesn't actually have that conversation in any way. And that's what, for example, um, Stephen King book. 112263 talks about is that oh let's let's prevent the assassination of JFK and everything's going to be fine and you, you, you deal with the ramifications the, the butterfly effect of that this film doesn't actually do that it just says if we eliminate these people that cause this uprising then everything's going to be great so that's that's a good point you're going to eliminate them but if the idea isn't there for people to learn off that it's a bad idea then someone else is probably going to have that idea anyway and you've got this whole problem coming back over again it's it was a like when you're watching the film, you're not really thinking about it, but afterwards I'm like, yeah, assassinating people for their ideas is sort of like, <laughs> you would, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I guess one the thing. one thing they have is is retrospect. So they, mm-hmm. they could see where it ended up and, and that up, it yeah. was a very negative thing. But um, yeah, I, you're right. It is, it is something that they've overlooked. Uh, what, what's some things that you, you took away from this film? I always have so much trouble articulating films that i liked it's it's a funny thing if i don't like a film i can find it all the things i didn't like about it and i could talk to them if i like a film i have trouble but for, for me this movie it was, it was like a puzzle and I, I just really appreciated it as i've said before that all the pieces fit together so nicely and even to the extent of finding things like the common thread that linked all the victims together um to raya's bloody hand which was an obvious one that we're always going to find out even from naveen rao using the modern day knowledge of creating his weapon in the future. Um, even the plane keys from 19, 1988 being linked to the 1997 incident. Everything was just clean and it fit. And I think my brain just appreciated the symmetry of it all tying up together and working. And as I said, maybe it wasn't the most cerebral movie going around, but it was just at the right level to get me thinking and understanding all in this one thought circle that just fit nicely. And when the movie ended, I was just like, great, that was so clean. I'm not sitting on Google going, oh, what happened here and what happened here? It was cerebral enough for me to be intrigued and, and need them to explain things to me from time to time, but it um, it wasn't too hard. I don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> I think that's really good because I like a lot of the stuff that you've just said, I've got down as well, but for a different sort of reason and sort of ties back into, you mentioned before the discovery, which we did a long time mm. ago. And I think possibly when I kind of remember when we discussed it, but I'm sure I mentioned that that would be a good film to rewatch. And I think that this sort of sits in that same category. And I know Hida who did that one with us had already watched it like twice. I think by the time we mm. did the podcast, but I think like going over my notes and I take pretty meticulous notes when we do these films and these things that you've mentioned, like the little things like the um, when, when Raya gets hit by the train and, you mentioned about apologizing for the partner and pulling the bullet and those things. And, and the only other one there that I, I, that you didn't mention was the the flowers on the grave, which they made a big deal about, which was obviously her as well. And like, I wouldn't like going back over my notes. I'm like, Oh, it makes sense now. It makes sense. It makes sense now. Like going back and watching it again, I probably enjoy it just as much because I'm more looking out for those little things that are just there that you don't, you just a part of the story as you travel along. So um, I think it would be an okay rewatch. It would be a satisfying rewatch, wouldn't it? I, I, I even do that with, with with all movies that I love. There's there's an element of this that works, and I think I think Bong Joon Ho does this as good as anybody. And he obviously isn't necessarily well. A lot of his movies do have a bit of a twist to them, but there are so many things in his movies where you rewatch it and go, "Oh my god, that's why he's sitting a certain way on the bus," or like the, it, it it all fits in together. And, and I think this movie is probably a bit a little bit less subtle in that. Um, but it is a sign of someone who's thought of every single element, every single frame. When you're sitting there at the start of shooting and you've got a frame to fill, you're making a conscious effort of everything that you're doing in there. You say, well, should I have my hand up or should I have my hand down? Should I wear a blue shirt or a black shirt? Like there's a reason. And th- someone's actually thought of the answers rather than just being like, oh, just do whatever works. And that, that I appreciate that. Very nicely put. Uh, did you go on IMDb at all to look anyone up in the film that you didn't recognize or you recognized and didn't know what you're from? No, I didn't actually. I think I was too into the film. <laughs> I, um, 
I did at the end just for, for Boyd. I was like, I've, what are you from? There's something like I've seen you in something and I know it's from, and it's bloody Steve Murphy from Narcos. I, I couldn't believe like, I've watched uh, the, the, the Narcos, the, the first version of it anyway, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, it's like the same sort of character. Um, uh, is it? I've never seen Narcos. I haven't seen the Mexican um, part, but um, the Pablo Escobar, the first part was really, really good. Okay. With uh, Michael Pina, uh, Michael Pina, yeah. Michael Pena, Very good. Yeah. Very good. All right. Did you have any questions that you wanted to ask? I got one for you. Um, do you think having Raya as someone with a Caucasian mother and an African American father made her this appropriate representation of someone to put a stop to this cause? Or do you think it was just to throw the audience from making a clear family connection to Tommy? Excellent question. I think that I would probably go with both and think that if we just discussed and said that they've purposely put things in in this film on purpose, then I reckon that they would have specifically done that as well. But I also think it does um, help with that twist as well to be like, you've got a, and they make a big point out of it being a, a black assailant that, you know, as an audience member, they're hoping that you're not going to click on somewhere that, she's related to lock down the line and this is another thing that works and i guess ties into our naivety is that they've just mentioned that or they mentioned probably not long before that that she's like oh you've met my boyfriend you've met him twice and then we don't think anything of it but then you see that rye is black and you're like well they can't be related it's like well hang on why why wouldn't george was it george or whatever why wouldn't he be black and it's just like, ah, oh, of course. And it all just kind of comes together and <laughs> crashes at you at once. I'm like, oh, he's, he is. We haven't seen him. And we know we haven't seen him because we've specifically said that, <laughs> that um, he doesn't remember him. Oh, it's just, anyway. Yeah. It's, it's, it was a good thought. Yeah. That was a very good question. Um, this sort of leads onto that a little bit. How would you deal with bringing up a grandchild knowing that she was going to die? Yeah. Because I reckon that would yeah, be that's... the next 20 years or whatever it is. That would be heartbreaking knowing everything you do is leading up to this moment like i it would be yeah it would be absolutely awful but on the flip side um if you can find a silver lining it is the cause that you know that she's done it for um i guess that responsibility of her death too <laughs> but when you when you're talking about these time trial situ time travel situation time trial time travel situations where um you know one little change means that it doesn't work like if if he didn't end up forcing her to fall in front of that train does everything still not work that way maybe she goes back in time even further and stuffs it up like you just you never know but it would be bloody hard and um yeah i can't wait to watch the sequel yeah well <laughs> like, I mean, imagine that, like we've seen every time leap he gets further and further away from his daughter and now he's he's back in the picture with the grandchild and he's gonna have to reveal to her at some stage that her kid's gonna die oh, just <laughs> Be, yeah, uh, I know, be right? a, good, a good drama possibly rather than a yeah, yeah, change of pace for sure. Yeah. Uh, we sort of we, we talked about this before at the start with the title in the shadow of the moon, and I'm not like I'm not sold on it. I get the connection that everything's happening every nine years with that moon, but there were times where she was out and about during the day, at the beach, oh. <laughs> things like yeah, that. So I guess yeah, I see. So, so I, I get that you know it's because of the moon every nine years, but there are like she doesn't have to do it just in the shadow of the moon. She's got that whole twenty four hours or whatever it is. I never thought that that was related to being a nighttime thing. That's yeah. that's that's yeah. It's silly of I, me because it does seem that way. Yeah, I don't know. I like I just think that a better title. That I and I can't think of one myself, but I just think a better mm. title would have been good. Yeah, the moon plays a big part, so you definitely want to keep that there because it plays a big part, but it also remains a little bit ambiguous. Um. My biggest issue with it, it just doesn't stick in my head. In yeah. the shadow of the moon, in the shadow, I, I almost got to keep saying it so I can remember it. But you know what? If this was like a big cinematic release and we had it plastered on our billboards and saw it on TV all the time, then we wouldn't think twice about it. I don't know. True. Last one for me, Michael C. Hall. He's, do you think he's better than his performance? Well, I've never seen Dexter, okay. so okay. I don't have the Michael C. Hall fanboy kind of love for him. Love for it. Yeah, fair enough. I don't know. I just it wasn't a big role though. No, nah, it's not a big role. There were just a few scenes that I was just like, ah, they, they look, they, they were hammed up a little bit. And I'm like, this isn't a, okay. this isn't a TV show. This is, this is a feature film. Like give us your chops. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, 
we're almost done. I think we're we're ready to sort of uh, tie this one all up and put it together, and we give the film a rating out of five and come up with an average. So, what's your final thoughts? What ah? Yeah, look in there. In the 150, 160 odd films that I've done on the podcast, this will definitely sit in my top 10 to date. And I think it's got a case. It's got a case for top five. Um, oh, geez. I was not expecting I just, that. <laughs> I just thought it was perfectly rounded. I thought it was wonderfully considered. It was well thought out. I, I appreciated the drip feeding of answers that fed my intrigue. And they did a really great job of balancing these wider social themes with these smaller personal ones i'm giving it four stars but it uh, uh, it could be a four and a half star movie one day and i said you can re-watch these sorts of films because for example the discovery i gave four stars to if i watched that again and liked it as much as i did i think it would earn four and a half star status and this is in that category I'm uh, blown away. I was not expecting a, a, a big four, but that's uh, that's impressive. It was a wonderful surprise. This movie, yeah. I, I thought I thought it was a solid film. I enjoyed it, and I, I think I've I've sort of said similar sort of things, the sort of things before with time travel films that we've done, and like it's hard to be original with time travel films, especially when there's usually so many rules and things that you have to follow. And, and I think that this film did a really good job of giving you just enough information of, of what was going on without giving you like this huge, big dump of science that, um, mm. you know, can become boring. So kept me engaged and um, made sure I enjoyed it. And I was really happy with the resolution. So I'm giving it a three out of five. <laughs> You do have to take a leap of faith with the science in it. Like they just kind of say, like, oh, moon comes there, and they could do this every night. I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. That's, that's enough. That's all I need. Yeah. Well, 3.5 average is uh, pretty good for a, a Netflix original. So hopefully uh, people get on board and give it a, a, a crack. Well, hopefully, if they've listened to this much, they've uh, seen it. Otherwise, seen we it, have yeah. just ruined <laughs> it. One hundred percent. We have socials. We've got Twitter. We've got Facebook and Instagram. Question to pop up with this week's post. Uh, don't have to have an answer for this, but if you could go back in time, what would you change or what idea would you erase? Oh goodness, yeah. No, I'm not prepared to answer that one uh, right now. Yeah. I think I need to have a proper think about it. That's a big, yeah. big decision. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to answer it either. But if anyone does want to give it a crack, feel free to on our posts. Give us a subscribe if you can. Give us a, a, a positive review on Apple Podcasts. A five-star nice. review gets us up in the charts a little bit higher, which would be nice. But we will be back next week for another Netflix original film from 2019. It's a supernatural horror drama called In the Tall Grass. This one's directed by Vincenzo Natale. It stars Harrison Gilbertson, Laisla de Oliveira. Avery Whitted, Will Bowie Jr., Rachel Wilson, and Patrick Wilson. So get on board. Give that a watch if you're interested. Is that the Patrick Wilson? The brother of Owen? Yes, it is. No, I mean oh. um, Patrick Patrick Wilson from Conjuring. Patrick Wilson. Nothing in the Luke Wilson. Right? Maybe. Anyway, we'll find out next anyway, week we'll when we watch it. We'll <laughs> find out. He's definitely related to Owen Wilson somewhere. Oh, okay, there you go. Yes, this is um, this is a Stephen King one. So, um, get on board, get excited. Ah, I do remember it when it came out. I think Me they uh, plugged it pretty heavily. They sure did. Well, um, I'm very very happy. A, a four star film from you. That's uh, that's huge. So we'll we'll take that one and put it in the bank. You never you nearly come up to four and a half, mate. So um, yeah, I'm glad uh, I'm glad we watched that one. Good. Well, um, been a pleasure, and I will see you next week. Hey, no worries. See you then.